Okay, well, good morning, trailblazing ladies. How are you today? Woo. Welcome to the Montana Chamber's first ever Montana Women in Business Summit in beautiful downtown Bozeman. Thank you all for traveling in. Thank God Mother Nature got the call and made sure roads were clear for us to all make it safely. I'm Candace Strauss, Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the Montana Chamber and Head Wrangler for Blazing Trail Summit, and I just can't say how grateful I am to see all of you here today. For those of you who joined us at the AC Hotel last night, at the benchmark on the rooftop overlooking the beautiful mountains, for the welcome reception, sponsored by Montana Health Co-op, the vibe in the room was electric. Nine months ago, as we embarked on planning this event, we were uncertain about the response it would receive. Today, as you look around this room, you'll see 230 women from all across the Treasure State today. Woo! Yes. This achievement stands as a testament to the dedication of the Summit Committee, the unwavering support of the Montana Chamber Board of Directors, and Todd O'Hare, my president and CEO, who believed in me to produce this event, and all of you. Your presence here today serves as a powerful affirmation of the significant role that women play in the business landscape of Montana. Together, we stand united, poised to break down barriers, exceed expectations, and assert our rightful position in the world of commerce. Thank you for your unwavering commitment to this cause. Throughout this summit, we will have the opportunity to learn from each other, inspire one another, and forge connections that will propel us forward, both professionally and personally. Together, we will harness the power of collaboration and innovation to create a future where every woman has the opportunity to thrive in business. Thanks to the generosity of Liz Markey and Two Bear Capital, we have five rural indigenous business women scholarship recipients with us today. I would encourage you to find them, meet them, and learn about their businesses. In addition, I want to thank our 31 sponsoring companies who incredible support have made this event possible. So please bear with me and maybe shout out when I mention your company's name. Our founding sponsors, Accelerate Montana, Bozeman Hotels and Motels, First Interstate Bank, JP Morgan Chase, the Montana Chamber Foundation, woo, <laughs> from the one man in the room, Northern Broadcasting System, Par Montana, yeah, Sabanye Stillwater, and Rustler Toyota. Also, our underwriting sponsors, Alpine Physical Therapy, Bozeman Health, Charles Schwab, Clear Skies Strategic Communications, our hospitality sponsor, Intrepid Credit Union, and our contributing sponsors, Big Sky Staffing, Billings Clinic Bozeman, Blackfoot Communications, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Montana, First Security Bank, Jesse Moore Photography, which she's taking photos of you lovely ladies right now, McKenna Adams Commercial Realty, Christy Jacobson, our Secretary of State, Northwestern Energy, Pacific Source, UBS, Danielle Darcy, Mo University of Montana College of Business, Whipfley, Women's Foundation of Montana, and Zero to Five. Can we have a full round of applause, everyone? Ooh. With that, I'd love to introduce Todd O'Hare, our President and CEO of the Montana Chamber of Commerce, who will introduce our 2024 Honorary Chair of the Blazing Trails Montana Women in Business Summit. Thank you all again for being here, and let the day begin. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, yeah. Well done. There you go, you should be all set. Well, good morning, my name's Todd O'Hare. I'm the president and CEO of the Montana Chamber of Commerce. And um, someone asked me last night, or they made the comment, it's like, oh, you're Candace's boss. And I said, yeah, I guess technically, but for the next couple of days, Candace is my boss. <laughs> and, and I wanna take a moment to really acknowledge the work that Candace put into this. She came with a vision and a concept and an idea roughly nine, ten months ago about wanting to do this. And I said, well, we've never done it before. 
but I think it's a wonderful idea. Let's try it, and let's see what sort of a response we get. And I think you can see here today, and you saw it last night, that the response was overwhelming. And I think you should be assured that this isn't a one and only sort of an event. We'll be doing this on an annual basis. And so as Candace embarked upon this journey to pull this together, you know, I told her several times, just let me know what it is that you need. And most of the time it was like, just stay the hell out of the way. And so <laughs> I stayed out of the way. But let's all give Candace a round of applause. The Montana Chamber of Commerce is the state's largest business advocacy organization. We represent businesses all across the state, from publicly traded companies to sole proprietors, in every business sector in the state. Agricultural businesses, traditional natural resources, retail, manufacturing, and high tech. And we're guided by a strategic plan that was put in place by business leaders in all those business sectors and more. And it was a strategic plan that intended to leverage the authority and the credibility of the Montana Chamber of Commerce, not to advance proposals or ideas that were good for specific businesses, but how do we improve the overall economy in Montana? What can we do to create an economy in Montana that we as Montanans, frankly, deserve. And so as we go through our day-to-day -day work, we focus on four big areas. Business climate, taxes, regulatory issues, judicial climate. We focus on infrastructure, roads, bridges, highways, water treatment facilities, access to high-speed internet and broadband, workforce development, how do we ensure that we have a pipeline of skilled, trained, and appropriately educated students coming into the workforce? And I always take a second on the appropriately educated, because we believe that Montana's charge should be to prepare students when they graduate from high school for a life that they choose, regardless of the path that they choose, whether that's path through a four-year university or a two-year college, or straight into the workforce. And the fourth one is entrepreneurship. Montana has been consistently recognized as one of the top entrepreneurial states in the country. And no one really knows why. Is it because we're this western, gritty sort of state? We're largely an agricultural state and we fix problems rather than look for somebody else to solve them for us? Or is it because for so many years the Montana economy has been so lackluster that those of us that want to keep Montana as our home are forced to create a side gig in order to afford the place that we love to live in? It doesn't matter, really, because the Montana Chamber and our business leaders said, let's go at this with intention. Let's not wake up and be surprised every year that we're one of the top entrepreneurial states. It creates wealth, it creates opportunities across the state. And so those are the four big areas that we focus on. And when I was talking to Jessica Dean last night, she's got daycare centers here in Bozeman and Washington, and I think the Dakotas, she highlighted exactly the reason for the purpose of the Montana Chamber of Commerce. She's busy, she's running a business, she doesn't know how or who to engage with on the legislative front, and she frankly doesn't have time. And that's where we serve our role, as the sword and the shield on behalf of businesses. In 2021, we had the most aggressive and successful legislative session in our history. The Montana Chamber of Commerce brought forward four bills aimed at improving Montana's economy. All four bills were signed into law. We started immediately at the conclusion of the 21 legislative session and said, what are we going to do for 2023? Go bold or go home is not a choice for us. We have to go bold. And so we entered the 2023 legislative session with 10 bills aimed to improve Montana's economy. And of the 10 bills that we brought forward, nine were signed into law. And so the issues that we're tackling as we go forward are issues that matter to every single one of you that have a business in here today. Child care, taxes, I serve on the governor's property tax, Task Force. I also serve as a co-chair 
of the Governor's Housing Task Force. So housing, taxes, child care, how can we do more to prevent and to minimize your exposure to litigation? None of that would be, would be uh, possible if we didn't have a great relationship in the governor's office. And it's particularly true with the lieutenant governor who has worked with us hand in hand over the course of the last three and a half years, vetting our ideas, helping us navigate what legislation we can bring forward that has the political will on the third floor, helping us identify these solutions. As an attorney, Lieutenant Governor Juris has been an incredible partner as we create the art of the possible amongst 150 people and if someone that sits on the second floor uh, in the corner office. And so with that, I am honored to introduce to you the honorary chair, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Montana, Kristen Juris. Now we are. You can see this is well rehearsed. Um, I am just so excited to be here and just the energy in the room. It, it, I almost get teary over it to see how far we have come. When I entered law school in 1979, women were just such a small fraction of the class. And to see uh, women in all types of professions in industries says a lot about our strength, our courage, our determination. <clears throat> so I just applaud all of you. Thank you for being here. Good morning. My name is Nancy Schlepp, and I am the chair of the Montana Chamber for um, 2024. And I live in uh, the metropolis of Ringling, Montana, which is about 40 people by White Sulphur Springs. And I'm so honored that I get to share the fireside chat today with our Lieutenant Governor, who has been a true inspiration for me most of my career. So thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and we have discussed some, some wonderful um, parts of the Lieutenant Governor's life and, and her career that we want to share with you and hopefully open it up for a few questions as well. So, so thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and um, let's start with, you um, received an award from the Montana Chamber last, um, this, this year, called the Red Tape Eliminator, and a lot of your time has been spent getting rid of laws on our books that no longer are adequate or no longer apply, and can you tell us about that process and what you're doing there? I would love to talk to you about red tape. When the governor asked me to join his team as lieutenant governor, we thought very carefully about what goals we had, and both of us wanted to focus on eliminating unnecessary, duplicative, inefficient regulations, because as an attorney, I have worked with many of my clients and have seen them stumble over the regulatory framework. And some regulations are necessary. We need processes in place. We need to protect the public. But I'll tell you, when it takes two and a half years to get um, a change of use application processed for a farmer who's irrigated and the stream has meandered, so he's got to move his pump to where the stream is, that's just unacceptable. So came in with a lot of enthusiasm about that, worked with all of the 13 agencies under the governor's jurisdiction, set up teams within each agency. And one of the biggest, well, joys, surprises was the um, staff at the agencies were equally excited. They'd just been waiting for someone who would make it a priority, who would give them the time, work with them to engage in this project because they're very, very busy and have lots of things going on. So they all got engaged and I can say 
now, as we sit here three and a half years later, the regulations under our roof have dropped from 12,000 to about 10,000, so almost a 20% reduction in regulations. In addition, we introduced in the 2023 session almost 200 red tape relief bills, and 177 of those were passed. I keep telling everyone this is a marathon, not a sprint. Part of the difficulty is just keeping people engaged. So I encourage all of you, we get a lot of great ideas from the public. For example, a young barber called me a few weeks ago and said, why don't we have apprenticeships for barbers? Great idea. We're going to bring legislation in 2025 uh, to address that situation. So we have a portal on the governor's page. If you have ideas how we can improve efficiencies in your industry or profession, give us a comment and we'll follow through on it. That is fabulous. You have been a very active lieutenant governor and such a role model for all women. Thank you for doing that. One question uh, that my family was curious about is what is the most interesting law that got repealed? <clears throat> I have to give you the backstory. Um, how many of you moms out there, your kids had to go door to door selling fruit um, or something for the schools to raise money? In Great Falls, it was for the choir, okay? Do you all know that your kids were breaking the law? If you sell fruit door to door that you have not raised, you had to apply for a huckster's license with the local county. So when we saw that law in the books, I called Cascade County, where uh, my home is in Great Falls, and said, my sons are selling fruit door to door. Can I get a huckster's license? Dead silence. So that was one of the funnest laws that we got off of the books. Your kids can now sell fruit door to door or vegetables without a license. <laughs> that is fabulous. It's, it's actually really funny to think that I've, I've had felons in my house, so that's <laughs> probably, probably myself. So uh, along with that, uh, this administration has been really a, a leader of women and having women in, in key roles. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, I'd love to talk about that. I actually met Governor Gianforte in 2016. We were both running campaigns at that time. Both of our campaigns were unsuccessful, but... We became good friends, and something that I really watched was his relationship with his wife, Susan, and how much he respected her, relied on her, made her part of his team. And I, it, just respect for women and how he valued what women bring to the table really stood out as one of his attributes. So when he called and asked if I would consider being his running mate, I, I was very eager to do so. Of the appointments within the governor's office, we have about 26 staff. More than half of them are women. We have two of our agency directors, Christy Clark at Agriculture and Amanda Castor at Department of Natural Resources, who are, are women. His chief of staff, Chris Hegum, is a woman. Our director of Indian Affairs, Misty Cole, is a woman. And he just appreciates the different sort of skill sets, insights, relationship skills that women have. And it's so great. So when I started out as a lawyer, I was the only female in the first law firm that I worked at. And it is such a pleasure, we all know this, to be able to have, I don't know if you guys know this, well, you should. Women at times do think differently than men. Women do relate to people differently than men. And it just helps so much for us to do well when we can be safe, vulnerable, transparent, open, which we usually are with more, e more easily with other women than with men, not always, but often. So it's a great um, team and environment to work within, to have other women as decision makers where we can talk things through. It's just great to have that support and mentorship. I think all women, it's so nice to see so many young women in the room. And I think we all need mentors. So I just encourage all of us um, with a little more maturity behind us, take the time to reach out and talk to these young women who are here today and engage with them and find somebody that you can mentor because that's so important. I do think it's so important to mentor. In fact, always 
be a mentor and find a mentor for yourself. It's always, always time to grow, so thank you for that. Uh, you and Governor Gianforte just announced you're running for re-election. Can you talk about that a bit? Yes, when I agreed to run back in 2020, I had made an initial commitment for four years because I do have grandchildren that I like to spend time with and family. And I have just um, found working with Governor Gianforte to be so enjoyable, so meaningful, so rewarding that I did decide to run with him again. Uh, we're a good team, we complement each other with my legal agricultural background, his business uh, technology background. Uh, it's, it's been a great team. And I love his style, which is very successful. He believes that you win the football game, he used to be a football player, um, with the three to four yard plays, not the Hail Mary passes. And so he has brought this process as we work towards the goals that we've established, many of which are to improve the economic uh, and legal environment for businesses so that they can thrive here and entrepreneurs. We just bite off what we think are doable pieces and move them forward. And we, then we go to the next one, and then we go to the next one. And I think that has been very effective. Another thing about his leadership skills is uh, he's, he's very smart, he has a great vision, but he doesn't micromanage you, he, he lets you know what the expectations are, what your role is, um, meets with you regularly to get updates, but really relies on the subject matter experts to help make decisions and making sure we're moving in the right directions, and he truly does listen and um, take into account what the people around him are saying so it, we can evolve as facts come to light or positions come to light as to how to remember. So I think that's a good goal for business owners too is just remember you, you, you win the long game by a lot of short successful steps and as Todd mentioned we've done that with a lot of legislation with the chamber and we hope to continue to do that. I hope you to continue to do that as well. Best of luck in your campaign. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is your grandchildren, which I know is one of your huge motivators for leaving Montana better. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. When I graduated from the University of Montana in 1977, I'm going to show my age here, I could not find a job in the state. I had to leave the state. When my sons graduated from their respective colleges, I come from a, a diverse family. I have a bobcat, I have a grizz, and I have an ore digger. And um, my ore digger, who's an electrical engineer, he could not find a job in Montana. He had to go out of state uh, and worked there for several years before this technology explosion in Bozeman, which finally allowed him a few years ago to come back. And I just had dinner with him last night. Um, so I want to make sure the governor, our goal is that we create job opportunities so that our children and grandchildren, if they choose to stay in Montana, and quite frankly, who wouldn't want to choose to stay in Montana, some of us might have to go away for a few years to realize what a beautiful place it is to live. We want them to have that opportunity to thrive here. So I am happy to say that since we took office in 2021, we've created over 40,000 new jobs in Montana. There are more people working in Montana now, 536,000 workforce, than ever before in the state, and we hope to continue to do that. That is fabulous, and I am very thankful for that because I also have a Bobcat graduate, a junior at Ordager, and a junior in high school that is a Grizz fan, so we'll see what <laughs> happens there. And. All right, so let's, let's move on to your career in, in teaching and being a lawyer, teaching at the university and being a lawyer and how that has really contributed to your success as Lieutenant Governor. I grew up on my family's ranch near Conrad and like many family agricultural operations, I had four brothers, which by the way, I think really helped prepare me for the world. <laughs> Um, and our ranch couldn't support all five of us, so I decided that I, what, I looked at what are the careers that I could choose that would help me stay involved with agricultural families, and I 
chose to go to law school and become a lawyer. And for many w years, I worked in a law firm in Great Falls. I went to law school out of state. Go dogs! I went to the University of Georgia, um, met a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech, married him, and it took us a few years to get back to Montana, but I came back in the late 1980s and worked at a law firm in Great Falls and primarily worked for our small business owners, farmers, ranchers, helping them navigate all of the legal issues they face on a daily, bis on a daily basis. And just became such good friends with so many of them. I, I loved that aspect of the practice. But it really was a struggle, and I suspect many of you struggle, finding that balance. Um, like a ranch, like being a lawyer, there's always something to do. And if you're kind of type A, like I suspect many of us in the room are, you tend to do everything rather than um, find that balance that we all need. So really struggling to find balance with three young boys and my career and my community work, I decided to try teaching at the law school. And that was another opportunity that I just loved. I loved working with the students. I was able to find a little bit more life balance in that particular profession. But it really, both my practical experience as well as teaching at the law school has helped prepare me to serve in this role as Lieutenant Governor because I have seeing the legal issues that people run into. I've studied them intensively through my academic career. That gives you a little more opportunity to do a little deeper dive in a lot of issues. So it's been very beneficial bringing that to the table. Absolutely, and you get to see a lot of your past students. Oh, that's one of the funnest things. I, I taught in my career approximately 3,000 students that I was there for 20 years and I taught, they had, to, they had to take me. I taught several of the required classes. And now, uh, just yesterday, I had a meeting with uh, somebody who was one of my former law students. He now works for an agency, and it's really a delight to work with them. Cassie, I was talking to her. Her mom, uh, Kimberly, was one of my students, and she had four children when she was in law school. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see students and, and women that you've mentored grow up and uh, run into them in their later paths in life. Thank you for all you've done in that area. So as far as policy goes, one of the things you and I visited about is the importance of building bridges and the bridges that you've been building with our indigenous Montanans. Can, can you visit about that a little bit? Yes, I, my family's ranch, a large portion of it uh, lies within the boundaries of the Blackfeet Reservation. And so for over 50 years now, um, our ranch has been there, and I, I'm not a tribal member. My sister-in-law is. I'm not a tribal member, but I did gain an understanding of, of the culture, and by the way, each of our, um, we have seven reservations, eight uh, tribes without our state. They each have their own cultures, and they are all unique. So the governor has asked me in his office to be, along with our director of Indian Affairs, Misty Cool, um, primary contacts with our tribes as we work with them. One of our goals and the tribe's goals is to improve economic opportunities within what we call Indian country, that, that's a federal legal term, and work with tribes. I, we've had several successes such as bringing career and technical programs to schools on the reservation, as well as other places throughout the state, working with their community colleges, establishing um, programs there. One program at, on the Flathead Reservation allows students to enter into a class, a class sponsored by an employer, and if they complete the class successfully, it's approximately a, a nine-month class, they come out with a guaranteed job and they can work remotely from home. It's very important to these cultures that family is very important, uh, that they, if they can work remotely, that's something that's um, important to them and we like to do. We're always look, working with the tribes to find where we can collaborate better state um, to tribe. So we've entered into several agreements, for example, with wildlife management. We just entered our first time ever probation and parole collaborative agreement so that the state and tribes can work together in that area. So that is one of the most rewarding parts, is working with the tribes so we work better sovereign to sovereign and create more economic opportunities within Indian country. 
Uh, thank you for your work there. And, and one of the most transformational programs that I've gotten to be part of as an adult is an indigenous immersion class that was a two-year program that Leadership Montana did that my friend Adriana, who's in the audience, we did together. And there's 10 indigenous leaders and, and 10 Montana um, leaders as well. And we were learning how to work together and it was very transforming. So thank you for your work there. Misty Cool, thank you for letting her work on that. She was one of the, the people that really gave a lot to planning that program. All, all right, um, how much, how are we doing for time? We have 10 minutes left? Okay, let's take a couple of questions from the audience if there's any anyone that has a question for the Lieutenant Governor. If not, I have some more. Don't be shy. Policy around childcare. Well, you're talking to a working mom who I understand the struggle. Uh, that was always challenging to find affordable, reliable childcare. What do you do when your child gets sick? And childcare, you know, they, they shouldn't be going to childcare. So that is a barrier, absolutely a barrier for women or the primary caregiver who still today is primarily women, uh, though certainly there's a lot of um, men that take that role as well. Making sure that we can keep women in the workforce um, by making sure that there is affordable childcare. It's, you know, it, it's a tough nut to crack. There's no silver bullet. So we are looking at different ways to do it. Uh, in one less regulation to allow more easily for, um, I had for a, a season one of my sisters-in-law in her house took care of my children making sure that we're not over-regulating those type of child care opportunities, which often are more affordable than going into a, a larger licensed facility. We are looking at scholarships that we provide to working parents so that they can have child care, the Big Sky Scholarships, and hopefully we'll be expanding those. But, you know, at the same time, we want the, those people who, who can afford it, um, we, we're not looking for government programs that uh, will subsidize across the entire population childcare. So we continue to, because in the end, that's the taxpayers who pay that, and one of the government, our administration's goals is to reduce our tax burden. We've reduced the income tax rate, individual income tax rate from 6.9% to 5.9%, and we hope to continue as if our budget, if it's sustainable to reduce that. So we are working on it. We recognize it's a problem um, and are looking at different avenues, a lot of three and four yard plays to get there. Thanks for the question. There's, there's a question, two questions in the, in the front here. Courtney. Maybe while we're waiting, I'll mention that all of the proceeds and profits from this event are going to uh, the Montana Chamber for um, child care legislation in the next session to, to help, help all of our working mothers, which I'm super excited about. All right, Courtney. Thank you. Uh, my name is Courtney Kibble-White with Northern Broadcasting. I know you're a ranch girl too, so you often probably see yourself as being able to do anything that the men can do. But um, I'm curious, just in the conversation of this room, and I've never been in government, but I tend to think that sometimes being a woman is a bit of a superpower. So I'm wondering if in conversations you've had behind closed doors over the last few years, if there have been moments where you thought, wow, if I wasn't there as a woman, this conversation wouldn't have happened or have happened differently be, because of the fact that, that you are a woman? Yes, absolutely. Like the child care issue, I, I really, because child care still tends to fall primarily on the women, I think we bring a perspective that sometimes men don't understand. We... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, and the whole life balance issues that women struggle. So, and some of the conversations we're having right now are, how, we know that there's a significant number of our people who could be working that aren't working today, and why is that? And a lot of it, it most of them, or not all of them, are, are women, and how do we bring women back into the workforce? <clears throat> We've also, as women, I am glad to be a Montana because I think in Montana, women have always um, been leaders. And, you know, Jeanette Rankin, you know, the, Montana was the first state to send a woman to Congress. Mo, in Mo, yeah, Mo, Montana has always applauded women, encouraged strong women. So I think we do face less barriers in Montana than in other places, but we still face barriers. And sometimes men are unaware of what those barriers can be, um, whether that's, they should be aware of pay disparity. So one of the issues that we're trying to address is pay disparity. If you, regardless of your gender, race, beliefs, you should be paid the same if you're doing the same type of work. So, and to his credit, I, the governor fully recognizes that women have different perspectives, different experiences. And that's why he has so many women um, in his cabinet, is to bring those, but undoubtedly. So raise your voices, women. I also will say, too, though, pick your battles. Um, focus on the things that really are important, child care, pay disparity. I, for one, for example, I never got upset when someone called me honey. And maybe that's in part because I, my grandpa called me honey, and I really, I, I knew he was trying to extend, you know, um, that he loved me by using those words. So that was a battle that I just, I, and I know that offends some people, and, and we would never call men in public honey, I know that, but pick your battles, uh, you know, put your energy where we really still see some disparities for women and go for it. So final question for you, Lieutenant Governor. Tomorrow is International Women's Day. And, and if you had a piece of advice you'd like to give all of these fabulous women in the room, what would you like to share with them? Don't be afraid to fail. We only grow outside of our comfort zone. And my, my experience, that's always where I grew, was when I took a risk, I did something that was scary, I did something that I wasn't sure that I was gonna succeed at. I failed at my first campaign when I ran for the Montana Supreme Court. I failed. But I'm so grateful I got into the arena and tried. I learned a lot. And best of all, I met Greg Gianforte. And here I am today. So don't ever be afraid to fail. That's where you learn. Please help me thank our honorary chair for the day, Lieutenant Governor.